Professor Grossman, this is our first online version for CE252 with narration. So 85% of you requested that you get some talking <laughs> in this slide, not just all text. That probably makes sense. All right. Uh, so let's hope it's worth worth the effort and that you learn something from the extra talking in this, which I think you will. So our agenda today, we're going to talk about level of service. And if you remember back two weeks ago when we were in spring break or before spring break, we did freeway level of service, and then we did multi-lane uh, uh, road level of service, and now we're doing the two-way road level of service. So that's uh, two lanes, one in each direction. So the smaller roads, uh, like a state highway kind of thing, city streets, that sorts. Or what we're looking at today, homework six was assigned. It's due tonight, uh, Monday, March 16th. Hopefully you didn't forget that, and Blackboard will remind you. I saw about... Well, 60% of you have already have it turned in, so that's great. Uh, through that, the project, still not quite sure what to do about the project since we're online only. I, most likely we can still do it. We have to do more individual projects. Um, I'm going to read through the handout uh, for that and make some changes in the next couple days. So probably by Wednesday, I'll have a, a handout for you uh, adapted from last year's. You know, about how to how we're going to do the project. I saw at least one email about an idea uh, on a project. I didn't miss that. I'm just still um, with our new paradigm here, doing online only, trying to figure out you know what to to do. You know, we may remove the project and assign the points to other things uh, through that. Well, about 25% of you indicated in the survey that you do not have do not have your textbook with you, and that you returned home. Um, either before or after spring break or during spring break and weren't able to make it back to your campus to get your book. So the, the one option is you can rent uh, for the, I think 120 days. You can rent the textbook. There's a link here. And if you open up the notes in there, that should be a hot link. You should be able to click that uh, that link there. Otherwise, just search Wiley, Mannering, and we're doing the sixth edition. That's the edition of our book. Uh, so I'll take you to the Wiley homepage, and then it's $20 and you can rent the textbook uh, from there. So we will need to read stuff out of it. I thought there was an online version. It turned out it's a different textbook. Uh, it's got similar things in it. It's about traffic and all that, but it's not our textbook. So that's not going to be that helpful. <clears throat> it's more of a second reference, but it's not. It can't replace this. Um, we've got a number of chapters to go. I'm not against scanning some sheets and sticking them in uh, for you guys to read, but uh, that's a lot. So. Um, I will think more about that by Wednesday, <laughs> try to give you an answer what to do about this textbook situation. You see that most of you sound like you have your textbook or you get a hold of it uh, through that. We do have a few in it. So thanks for filling out the, the quiz, slice survey or questionnaire, whatever I called it. It was helpful uh, to get an idea what to know. I was hoping only 10 of you or 10% of you would want the narration and I could save all this time. But anyway, um, it's not that bad. So let's go on with narration. Uh, feel free to send me emails um, or guests, give me comments on the YouTube page uh, about what works, what works or doesn't work for you. You know, can you hear it well? Is the video quality all right? Is this a terrible format? You hate hearing me talk. You know, anything like that. Uh, stuff that can help. Well, hopefully, constructive criticism. Right? Don't make me cry. The um, so. Like they send me email is probably the best way and direct. I'm not sure I read my comments on YouTube. I'm not really a YouTuber, uh, as you might have guessed. All right. So uh, next up, uh, Stephen is our next presenter. So Stephen, I'll get I'll send you an email. There's a way to record video over the top of your PowerPoint, and then I'll just throw that in the slide deck, and then everybody can hear you talk. Uh, as you do your presentation, or you can make your own little video. So think ahead. You know, if you still haven't done your your project presentation for class, um, this is your your chance to become a YouTuber and make your own little video clip uh, with that. And uh, you can include video and you know, live action stuff if you want. Um, so I guess maybe that uh, frees things up even a little bit more. All right, let's move on um, for today's lecture. And it never wants to go forward until I get it going. There we go. All right. Today we're doing two-lane highways. We've got one lane each direction. This is generally lower traffic volumes, right? The freeways and multi-lane highways were for high traffic volumes. Go figure. All right, through there. 
These have a free flow speed of between 45 and 65 miles per hour. Lots of design standards. We're going to talk about that, right? So the multi-lane highways tend to be very, fairly similar. Freeways tend to be fairly similar in how they're designed. These modern ones are. Let's say really old. Two-lane highways covers a wide range, right? It could be the, the tiny little county road out in front of some farm uh, fields and, and running through the countryside. It, it can be a fairly high volume, you know, 15,000, you know, 20,000 vehicles a day connecting two larger towns. Uh, and, you know, maybe someday it'll become a multi-lane highway, but now it's still two-lane. And high design standards, well-marked and all that. So um, just think about all the different two-lane roads you've seen. There's a, quite a range. Uh, through that. That makes these unique uh, two lanes. We have to actually split them into a number of or three smaller subcategories after that. You can have an occasional traffic signal stop control on these um, for this level of service to work. You've got to have a fair bit of open space in between intersections, uh, stop controlled intersections where you either a signal is that or a stop sign. You know, through there. If you're in town and you have a lot of uh, controlled intersections like that, we use different techniques you know, for that. We'll do a traffic modeling piece uh, through there. And the, the concept to remember in two-lane highways is to pass somebody else, you have to cross over the center line, you know, use a yellow line or a dash line, and and pass a vehicle. And that's going to be the critical piece. That's the difference here, right? Before we measured things, uh, everything was moving in a single direction. You're you're doing your level of service in a single direction, and you have multiple lanes. So it's easy to switch lanes and get around somebody and go through there. So this is uh, section six six in your textbook. This is highway capacity uh, manual chapter um, twelve and twenty. If you want to look it up, this is where the root of it came from, was from the highway capacity manual through there. And the question is, how are we going to measure the level of service on a two-lane road? All right, so here's a couple of pictures, examples of two-lane roads. These are better, better uh, examples of two-lane roads. Uh, well, the one on the right, you have tons of sight distance, right? You can see forever there. It should be easier to pass, right? We're going to talk about that in a second. All right. So what effects? What effects uh, levels of service on, on two-lane roads? Now, well, how... We, you know, before we've gone through what affects levels of service in freeways and multi lanes, does any of that transfer over to a two lane road? What's new about two lane roads? What's what would different? What would be different? All right. So what I just talked about one of them is that you have to cross the center line to pass. All right. So if you're thinking about driving uh, anywhere, if you're on a two lane road, one of the things that's a hindrance to you that would lower your level of service or lower the traffic flow rate. Uh, through that or your travel times, however you want to measure that or what piece of it uh, fits in your in your head you think affects that level of service that you feel the most. One of it could be you get stuck behind slow cars. Right? And so that's going to be a, a big piece of level of service. Some of the things that transfer that are the same that we've done before is lane width, shoulder widths, um, sight distances, things like that. That gives that's that feeling of safety you have as a driver, which will affect how fast you can drive or want to drive, and how safe you feel. And so that's a level of service piece uh, through that. So those are some of the factors that transfer. Again, the new one is that to get around anybody to keep free flowing movement going, is you have to cross the center line and move into the other lane uh, through that. And so then the question comes up is how often can you pass? And that's going to be a big feature. So keep looking for that. There's a little foreshadowing as we go through uh, two-lane highways, right? So here's some examples. These are from national parks, all right? So here's some two-lane highways. Here are some wide open ones, uh, higher design standards. It has a little bit of a shoulder there, very straight, lots of sight distance uh, through that. And then this is also a, a two-lane highway and a little bit different design standard, right? There is, you know, no over here on the on the right shoulder, there, there is no shoulder there. <laughs> You're right up into the rocks, right? This is a national park. This might be Zion uh, through there. Still two-lane highway, right? So still, that's still within our, our range, right? Two-lane highways, again, lots of, it covers a wide range of design standards. Here's the 10% grades with five mile per hour switchbacks. They're really steep, and it's a gravel. Right, so this is parts of it are gravel. This whole road isn't all gravel, but parts of it are right through there. This is still two-lane highway. Right? So that's kind of cool. This one just pops up out of nowhere. This is in southern Utah, 
Now, right before you go into the Valley of the Gods, if you're headed south, uh, up here on the rim is to the north, and then off this direction is to the south. And so you're just driving along through this scrub uh, scrub area with a bunch of bushes uh, through there, and all of a sudden you come up on the lip of this uh, plateau, and down this little switchback you go. And it is five miles per hour, and it is gravel in spots, and it's a little hairy, <laughs> right? Uh, if you're... You might have to have a strong stomach if you're on the outside in the passenger seat if you're headed south uh, along that road uh, through there. That's still a two-lane road, right? And that is covered somewhat uh, in our levels of surface uh, through this. So a wide range of, of roads is the main thing to keep in mind there. How should we measure the level of surface on a two-lane road? We've got free flow speed is what we're going to look at. We're going to look at lane width, lateral clearance. That's your shoulders. Uh, your shoulder width, and how many access points, so how many driveways. So that should sound very familiar because we've done um, not access points, but everything else was in freeways. Access points were all, was and those other things were all in multi-lane highways. Uh, we also care about how many heavy vehicles there are. That also affected levels of service in the past two uh, uh, classes of roads we've looked at before, right? And driver population is back, right? So again, are they familiar drivers or not familiar with it? And the grade of the road, how steep is it, right? That one from southern Utah, that was a very steep, uh, some very steep grades, 10% grades. You can imagine that's going to really hurt level of service, not to mention the five mile per hour curves uh, through there. So all those things are factors that affect level of service, is it, with that? I, again, we already mentioned the Cars going in both directions is going to be a big difference between what we did with freeways and what we're now doing with multi-lane multi -lane roads through there, right? So that opposing direction traffic is a big effect on how much level of service we've got, right? You need to, it hurts your level of service a lot if you can't pass. And you can't pass when there's a lot of cars in the opposing lane or you can't see, right? So a hilly terrain mountainous terrain, you have a lot fewer opportunities to pass, and if there's a fair bit of traffic, those almost drop to zero. You're just stuck uh, behind whoever you, you're behind, right, through there, especially if you have heavy vehicles or RVs and so forth, All right? So terrain has that significant effect on the restrictions in that passing site distance through there. And because there's such a range in two-lane roads, we split them into three different classes, and the highway capacity manual uh, uh, breaks out those for us. All right, through there. So this is the first class. This is class one. This is the better of the, the two-lane roads. These are ones where motors are trying to get somewhere, right? So some of those roads we had pictures of before were uh, major links and long links, but they were major links between bigger populations, like the, that one road within the Valley of the Gods there with the plateaus in the distance and very straight. That road uh, is connecting Moab uh, down into Arizona towards the Grand Canyon. Right? So there's a fair bit of traffic on that road usually, and, and a lot of Instagrammers like to stop there and get pictures taken in, the, in that long straight stretch there. So that's a fairly famous piece of road um, through that. Not enough traffic to warrant a freeway, but it's still people are expecting to go somewhere, and that's, you know, hours in between those two cities where they're headed, Flagstaff to Moab. They expect to be traveling high speeds uh, through there. And they don't like being stuck behind other people, so you, would, you wouldn't you would expect on a class one road to have to be trapped uh, and not be able to pass for too long, right? Inner city routes, like I just mentioned, those are one uh, what this would normally include. Primary arterials, you're connecting major traffic generators between that. It could be daily commuter routes, and it's a primary link you know, within the state or the national highway network. So these are, these are high-end, important two-lane roads. Now through there. Class two is, is as we're, you might guess, one step down, right? So motorists aren't necessarily expecting to always be going 55 or 60 or whatever the speed limit is in that area. It's not always expected that you can travel at high speeds. Typically shorter routes uh, may be passing through rugged terrain, right? So you would not expect to be able to maintain those, those high speeds and, and lower travel times uh, through that, right? The, the main thing that motorists in this case want is they want to extend, avoid ex extended time following other vehicles, you know. So if they are behind a truck, you know, at some point they can get around and pass, right, or, sorry, or anybody else and you know, driving slowly through that. And then finally is our, our class three roads, which are, you know, the lowest quality, the, <laughs> the lowest expectations are on class three roads. And these are really linking, you know, typically these are routes that are going to link you to your house, right, um, through there. 
And so you get off of the primary roads and then you get into the collectors and now you're finally on the local roads and streets and these are what lead to your house. You're not really expecting to go fast on those. Well, maybe you are, but <clears throat> excuse me, generally not. All right, so the the idea is more access. And and no, when you when you get out on the main road, that's when you expect to pick up speed and be able to keep moving, and then you get annoyed when you can't uh, either maintain speed as you want right through there. On these class three roads, people don't really expect it, right? So these are recreational routes, scenic routes, um, in little roads, roads in small towns, these little county roads going out by the farm uh, ground and so forth, right? They're not expected to be high volumes, not expected to be high speed. They're not typically that well maintained. No, so that's a class three road, right? So the, so how do we work through and do our level of service analysis uh, for two lane roads? Very similar again to what you saw, if you remember, before spring break in the freeway in the multi-lane uh, setup. So first we have to establish our base conditions. Then we're gonna check out how many heavy vehicles we've got. So again, heavy vehicles are gonna have a big impact on how how well that road flows right through there typically not helping uh, with the number of heavy vehicles that includes rvs on that so we saw some some of those roads from uh, the scenic areas and from national parks it's more rvs there that are slowing everybody down through there we have to then figure out what our free flow speed is and we're either going to estimate it or we're going to measure it and which one do we prefer to do that's right. We would rather measure it if we can. If we can't measure it, then we can estimate it. All right. So in order of preference, measure would be the best right, to use that. Again, we're going to look for low volume times to do that, and just like we did in the other two uh, level of service situations we looked at. Then we're going to calculate analysis flow rate. Again, that's a V sub P. We've done that in the last two uh, types of roadways right, through there. And then finally, we come down and we're going to determine the level of service. And I'll, I'll define these terms later as we get there. But based on what our category is, our class, class one, two, or three, we're going to use a combination of different uh, measurement variables. And so we'll, we'll get into those in a bit. Base conditions, again, this is perfect situation where you're going to get the maximum flow. So these are our base conditions. First one, lane width will be 12 feet. Uh, shoulder widths is, are 6 feet. And so that's that lateral clearance piece. We've done that before. In this case, you can always pass. And so in the base condition, all of the road is a passing condition. All right, so you have 0% no passing. There is always a, a dashed line down the center of the road, not, not a solid line. All right, through there. You'd only have passenger cars, no heavy vehicles. There are no driveways. So uh, that one picture from Arizona, yeah, that they were. <laughs> it was pretty much all because it was so flat. Passing zone, and there were no driveways out there because there's no houses in that area, all right? And there's no impediments to through traffic. There's no stop signs or, or traffic signals, and it's level, and that all the grades are less than two percent. Right. So that's all. Those are all good things, and those all give us our best level of service. Yeah. So that's our base condition. And just like we talked about before, anything less than this is going to restrict flow and is going to lower your, potentially lower your level of service. And we will adjust for those just like we did before. All right. Um, what we're looking at in in two-way two roads is that uh, our capacity in both directions combined. So this is the worst case. This is our um, the maximum capacity per hour would be 3,200 vehicles, and that's in both directions. Or in a single direction, it would be 1,700 passenger cars per hour. So this is passenger cars, not trucks in this. We'd have to convert trucks into a passenger car. That's what our capacity would be. Right. And you're like, well, 1,700 is not half of 3,200, so what's going on here? Well, if you've got 1,700 in one direction, well, that'll give you 1,500 in the other. Or evenly split is 1600 and 1600 right so you could have a, a slightly uh, stronger flow in one direction up to 1700 in a per passenger cars per hour again it's a single lane right in a single direction so that'll be our maximum capacity and that's a little higher um and at highway speeds that's that's pretty good right we were saying even at a traffic signal we talked about before, 1,800 is about normal for a 35, 45 mile per hour road. We didn't drop it down much for a single lane at higher speeds right, through that. 
So that's that's one of the constraints we're looking at. That's what our capacity is in a two-lane uh, road system right through there. We're going to look at measuring the free flow speed. So if we had to measure it, right, we were going to check out what's the mean speed, the average speed of all the vehicles, if our flow rate is less than 200 passenger cars per hour measured in both directions, which is essentially 100 passenger cars per hour in each direction, right, through that. If you're below that, if you're that number or below, then traffic should be light enough, should be spaced far enough apart that we can just straight up take the average speed, and that'll be our free flow speed, right? And as we've talked about before, as traffic increases, then the traffic is going to bunch up and they affect each other, and they aren't going to uh, travel in a free flowing manner, and then we can't use that number so much. Right. So, and this is what we do then. So we adjust. If speeds are measured uh, under a flow rate, we should say over a flow rate. If they're over 200 uh, vehicles per hour, then we're going to use this adjustment. Right. And so we're going to take this is the average speed. I'm not sure. We'll flip the next slide. We're, our estimated free flow speed is the mean speed that we measured, and then we have this adjustment coefficient here, and then we have the actual measured uh, flow rate in vehicles per hour divided by the uh, heavy vehicle adjustment factor, right? So we can adjust the, the free flow speed for that. So if you're over 200 vehicles per hour, you use this adjustment. What you measure is probably going to be lower than this, the free flow speed, and then we're actually adding some miles per hour onto it, and that'll give us an adjusted free flow speed. I'll do that. So it's not always, a, you know, it's, uh, sometimes hard to find a period when you're below that 200 uh, vehicles per hour to measure it. And so if you do, then you can use that adjustment factor. All right. So, and then this will look fairly similar. It's a few less terms than we did before for multi-lane. But our free flow speed then could be our estimated, our base free flow speed, BFFS. And then we're going to subtract off some number of miles per hour for the uh, lane and shoulder width. So our a factor for lane and shoulder width here, and we're also going to uh, subtract off some mile per hour for the number of access points we've got. And luckily, we've got tables that show us that uh, the same as they had before, right? And so this one's a little different than we did for multi lane. This one's got lane width over here on the left column, and then we've got a shoulder width here. And so you enter the matrix and you pick out this is the number of miles per hour reduction in free flow speed. So if we had a lane width that was 10 and a half and a shoulder width that was three, we would end up here. We would subtract 3.7 miles per hour off of our base free flow speed. Right, do that. Access points, how many we've got per mile. This is, again, a chart. We use the same thing for, for multi-lane. Uh, roads, the same kind of chart uh, for those. So again, if you had 10 access points, you'd subtract off two and a half miles per hour and so forth and so on. And the access point is either a public road or a driveway uh, through that. Then this should look fairly familiar too. So here is our V sub P, right? So that's our passenger car equivalent flow rate right, through there. But we start with the raw, I guess the gross number of vehicles counted, capital V. And we've talked about that um, before, too. So that's your, that's your peak hour volume, including all types of vehicles, trucks, RVs, any kind of vehicle. But here's our peak hour factor that adjusts for the peak 15 minutes out of that hour. Here's our grade adjustment factor, whoops, right there. And then we've got our heavy vehicle factor. And so you should be familiar with these two, or at least the heavy vehicle factor one, uh, the grade adjustment factor is new. We can relate that capital V, that gross number of vehicles who pass an hour, then to an equivalent number of passenger cars. And that's what we really want. We want that V sub P right through here. So for grades, this is how we look at it. So for average, um, here's our, our flow rate. And so by flow rate, and then we come here and rolling terrain, we would say we've got about a 0.9. Our factor is about 0.9 uh, through there. In a level terrain, it's probably not, it's probably not being adjusted at all. And you can see that I'm not sure why we even include level terrain in here, uh, but we did. And but the rolling terrain is what matters, right? And so, um, so this is our average speed adjustment factor, our F sub G, and then this is our percent time spent following adjustment factor, 
We're going to talk about that more later. The idea is that this is how percent time spent following, PTSF, that's one of the terms you're going to read later. PTSF um, is how long you're stuck behind the guard in front of you on average. What's the, expect, what's the expectation that you're going to uh, be following somebody else uh, through this whole time, through there. And in, in rolling terrain, uh, if you're less than 100 vehicles per hour, maybe 73% of the time you're stuck behind somebody. As, as the flow rate increases, more of that time that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be, you can expect to follow someone else, right? You're going to be stuck behind another car. And so you can see that these numbers jump up then as you go through there. So for heavy vehicles, this is our equivalency uh, factors for trucks and RVs, and that fits into the F sub 8 VH uh, equation that we use. And so this is our, our trucks and buses, RET, um, RVs, for all flows, just use these, right? So for average travel speed, we're going to use, when we adjust the average travel speed, we're going to use for level train 1.9 if we have 100 vehicles per hour and rolling train 2.7, right? And so uh, as the interesting thing, interesting thing here is as, as this demand of flow rate increases, these adjustment factors actually drop because no one's passing anyway. And so the effect of the trucks, uh, they're just stuck in the stream of cars like everybody else. And so it actually has a little bit less effect. Kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, through there, you can see the same thing in rolling train. They start out with a much bigger difference because in light traffic, uh, the truck in its troubles in going up and down hills is going to make a bigger difference than it is in heavy traffic. And it still slows people down a little bit, but at this point, you're all just stuck in traffic and you're all just following along anyway, right? So it's kind of interesting how those tables work. All right, we'll do there. So those are the tables. The, the book describes those in a lot better detail and shows how to plug those into it, right? So now we talked about these these factors. Is what's the what do we use to measure level service? You know, what is what's that service measure that we're going to uh, look at? If you remember freeways and multi-lane roads, it was density. We cared about density. Uh, so over a certain vehicles per lane per um, mile, I think density, vehicles, passenger cars per lane per mile, we would pick out what our level of service was. And that's how we define level of service. When in two lane roads, we don't really care about density anymore. We're going to use these three other terms. And so ATS is your average travel speed. And that's back here. So you're in the average travel speed, right? Um, PTSF is percent time spent following. So that's how long, what percentage of your trip you're going to be stuck behind a car in front of you and can't pass. You can't get around them. And then, um, and so those are our first two. And then when we get to class three, we're going to talk about the last one, which is the percent free flow speed. And so that's of the free flow speed, what percent of that speed are you driving? The free flow speed is 50 and you're going 40. Um, right, so you're at 80% free flow speed, and that's the term we use for for class three, because you're not really expecting to pass on a class three two lane road. For class one, um, you care about how fast you're going to get there, so average travel speed is important, and you care about getting stuck behind other people through there. In a class two road, you're never really not going super long distances. Those are shorter trips usually on a class two two lane road. It's more about uh, what what percent of the time am I stuck behind somebody? Um, the long-term average travel speed isn't as important, but it's still annoying to get stuck behind a truck. And then finally, in the class three, it's just, you know, of the free flow speed, what percent of that can I go? And that's how we calculate then levels of service on that. So our, our average travel speed calculation, and so our directional analysis of the average travel speed is the free flow speed minus this. Uh, coefficient right here, 0 0.00776 times the analysis flow rate in the analysis direction. That's how many cars, um, little v, not capital V. This is the passenger car equivalent cars going in the direction that you're going to go in. So if I'm going northbound, that's my northbound v. v naught is the opposing. It's actually v0, I guess, not zero. Is the opposing 
uh, equivalent flow rate, again, converted from all types of vehicles to just passenger cars. And those are, those are people coming south. Or this is, if we're going northbound in the analysis direction, this would be the southbound traffic. Right. And why do we, why do we add those together? Yeah, because this is a, a factor of how well you can pass, right, um, through there. So the, the number of vehicles going in the opposite direction matters in a two-lane road, where it didn't matter in freeways and multi-lane roads uh, previously. All right, so we add those together, and that's, we combine that, because we do care about both directions of traffic, right? And then we have an adjustment factor then for the percentage of no passing zones. So the, not only, remember our base condition, there, there was always a passing zone. Um, if we adjust now over here, in the average travel speed calculation, based on what percentage of the the distance of the road mileage is actually a no passing zone, and so we have an adjustment uh, factor for that. All right. So this is that no passing uh, zone adjustment factor. This is Table 617 in your book. F sub n p. All right. And now we're basing it on opposing flow rate, and you're your percent of no passing zones. So 20% no passing zone means 80% of the time you have a dash line and you could pass, right, uh, through there. And, and you can see, and this is for a free flow speed of 65 miles per hour, 60 miles per hour. The book goes on, you know, even more <laughs> through that, uh, uh, through there. And so if you've got 80% no passing, which is that you can rarely pass, right, you know, you're going to have uh, a fairly high uh, reduction in um, in that free flow speed, right? So this is our factor that we're calculating. The FNP just drops in here, right? So we're subtracting that number off of the free flow speed. We're subtracting that number off of there. This is in miles per hour. So we're, we're subtracting these miles per hour off of whatever that free flow speed was that we knew before, which could have been measured or could have been calculated. Uh, through that. All right, and then we, we base it on the opposing flow rate. So if I'm going northbound, this is the southbound number of vehicles uh, through there. Again, and why? Because the opposing flow rate is however many cars there are over here, they are, are, are closing that window of being able to pass. All right, so even though I may have, in this case, there's only 20% no passing zones, but if I have a high volume of traffic, you know, I'm never going to get around them. Uh, uh, through that, and in if there's never, it's kind of odd how these are relatively similar. Again, at high volume, opposing volumes, <clears throat> there was never a chance you were going to pass anyway. So it doesn't really matter what, how much, how many passing zones you had because you're just at 1,600 oncoming vehicles per hour. There's never a gap big enough for you to pass. That's kind of what we're looking at here. So. If you know what your opposing flow rate is, say it's 600, and it's a 60% no passing zone, you'd subtract 1.7 miles per hour from this equation off of your free flow speed. That's how you'd find out your average travel speed uh, through that. Right. Percent time spent following, we've got more adjustments. That This is, I will say this, the two-lane roads are a real bear, and they're, it seems like in endless calculations. Uh, through this, because each each step has its own calculations as you go through it, All right? So the percent time spent following, you start with your base percent time spent following in the analysis direction, and so that's what you're, you have your base rate, and now you're going to adjust that for that percentage of no passing zones, and you're going to take your your adjusted volume, your passenger car volume, uh, in northbound divided by northbound plus southbound. So what this is a ratio of the people going in the same direction you're going in. And that will give you then uh, eventually, <laughs> plug this all through, that will give you the percent time spent following you, your estimated um, percent of the time that you're stuck behind another car. All right, through that. All right. Your, so that's, all right, so this equation, oh, what's this base percent, percent time spent following? We haven't seen that before. How do you find that? Well, that's this equation, right? So one more equation uh, through that. Like I say, two lane roads is not easy, right? So this, to find that, we take 100 times 1 minus the e, <laughs> the natural log, right, of um, a times v, the b over d, 
All right, and so that's our analysis flow direction. We picked these coefficients a and b are, are popped out of the, another table. So we look for another table to find that out. v sub d is the number of people going northbound, if that's the direction we were headed, right? And that's passenger car equivalent. So you're already corrected for the number of trucks, and you have passenger cars only. And then we have to look up coefficients a and b uh, through there. Whew. All right, so that's that's that'll be in table 619. So look that up there. So we, and then we're back here. This is our um, no passing adjustment. We saw that. This is um, that's this guy, right? So here's our no passing adjustment FNP. That's from this table. This is 618 uh, table, and so it's a whole different table, right? And before that. So once again, this is com very cumbersome, right? And this time we're looking at the two-way flow rate, not just the opposite. Last table we looked at was just the opposite flow rate. Now we're combining the analysis direction D and the opposing direction O in there. And we're combining them together. You can see these numbers are much bigger, almost twice as much as before. Right through that. Here's those coefficients, right? So this is that table we were looking for. And so at the now we're just looking at opposing flow rate. Uh, 600. Here would be the A coefficient and the B coefficient. We're going to plug in to that equation. All right. Here's our A and our B. We're going to plug those two into there. All right. So we're confused yet? Yeah. No. So these, <laughs> it's a, it is a really long process. These two lane roads. Just be really careful. You read these titles up here in the in the tables, right? So you remember that some of them are opposing flow rate. Some of them are the two way flow rate. So uh, be careful. Um, it pays to pay attention uh, in those tables because it, it is confusing and they look very similar, but they suddenly switch definitions on you. All right. Whew. Okay. Finally, uh, the last term we we haven't done is for class three roads. We've got the percent um, of the free flow speed that you're able to travel. So if the free flow speed is 45, what percent of that can I go? And that's how you. For a class three road, that's how we would judge how well that road's working. Right? If you only go half of free flow speed, that's not very good, right? We're not happy about that. All right. So our our percent of free flow speed is the average uh, travel speed over the free flow speed. So we're just doing that ratio, and that's what we base the class three level of service on. Right? Do that, and we we've already seen an equation for how to calculate the average travel speed right, through the analysis direction. And the free flow speed, we can also measure or estimate that you know, through that. All of this comes down to table 620, which is where we can determine, this gives us the uh, zones for each level of service. So finally, we get level of service through that. So there's a lot of calculations. We finally get to this point, right? It's tricky. Class 1 is an odd one. In class 1, both of these columns have to be correct for you to be that level of service. All right. Class two, you only have one thing, percent time spent following. And class three, you only have one thing, which is the percentage of free flow speed. It's so like in this case, class three, this is easier examples. If you've got a 93% of free flow speed that you're able to travel, you're, you're level of service A, right? If you're below 91.7, you're level of service B. If you're below 83.3, you drop down to the next category and so forth. So you kind of read these down, right? And so that's how you find out which zone you're in with your level of service here, right? Through that. Same with class two, you only have to worry about one number of percent time spent following. If if my percent time spent following is 45, what's my level of service? So I'm between 40 and 55, 45 is bad, right? The higher the number is bad here. So that's going to be a level of service B. All right. If I've got a 57, uh, you may, uh, don't be tricked, right? They start low and go high. Do there. So if I got a 57, I'm actually down here. I'm going to be level of service C. All right. Because I am, um, I'm above 55. That's the maximum for level of service B. Okay. So, Reading those two, all right, now we're getting a feel for it. Now we can jump over here to class one. Both of these things have to be true. And so it's the same kind of idea. If I'm at 52 
it's it's getting higher as we go down. 52 is greater than 50. The maximum percent time spent following for level service B is 50. 52, I'm already in level service C. Right. So if my average travel speed, and here's an example, if my average travel speed is 55 miles per hour, right, but my percent time spent following is 52, what level of service am I in? All right, my average travel speed is 55, but my percent time spent following is 52, what level of service am I in? Well, 55, greater than 55 is level of service A, right at 55 would technically be level of service B, okay? So you can't be better, both things have to be true to get your level service, or the, you might say the worst condition of either of these two columns is your level of service. But at a percent time spent following uh, 52, that's bigger than 50, so I'm in level of service C. So even though average travel speed is level of service B, percent time spent following with the level of service C, you take the worst. My, my total level of service is C in this case, right? So these are tricky. This is a really good exam question. I almost always throw one of these in there. I give you two numbers. One of them is at one level of service. One of them is at the other. you got to pick the worst. And you've got to read it in the right direction, right? This one's starting low and going high. This one's starting high and going low. It's confusing. Right? We have trouble with that every time. All right, you've got an in-class um, one to calculate. You get your practice in on that. There is a quiz in uh, Blackboard, and there's a link to the PDF. So you've got to open the quiz and click on the link. It'll open up what would have been the handout we would have had today in class. Here, there, read through it. Actually, enter your answers though in the Blackboard quiz. You're going to pick a level of service A through D, and you're going to choose one of those, and it'll automatically grade and, and all that uh, through there. So. Um, so yeah, go to the in class. It's in the same folder. It's in lecture 22 uh, folder. I think we're at 22, and it'll it'll say ICA. Hmm, not sure which number we are right now, but bank 15 maybe. Just go to that link. In that's a quiz type in Blackboard. Inside that is a link then to the actual handout that you can pop up and and read and then answer the question or that. So hope that works. Um, let me know how this goes, right? If you can hear me well, if, if you can see things well, if the clarity is good enough, I'm going to post this on, on YouTube and then put a link here inside the folder through that so you can actually um, you can flip through the lectures eventually uh, on YouTube as we develop more of these. Or you can come back into Blackboard and, and come into the individual lecture folder and then click the link in there. So either way should work fine. All right, we'll see you next time.